never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love. It's higher than the mountains. And it's higher than the mountains that I face. And it's stronger than the power of the grave. It's constant through the trial and the change. Is this one thing?
Father, we stand on that truth today. As you remind us that your love never runs out on us. People come, people go in our lives. People say things, people mean things. But people still waver, Father. And there's no wavering in the name of Jesus. And we can stand on that truth today as the foundation of what we know love is. That you are constant, that you are true, that you will not run out on me. And I'm thankful for that today. Thank you that your love is so big and so wide that even in my sin and in the midst of my failures and faults, Father, you still reach out your hand and say, come on, come close, draw near to me. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Come close. And we celebrate that today, Jesus mighty name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Sing in death and life. In death, in life, I'm confident and covered by the power of your great love. My death is paid. There's nothing that can separate my heart from your great love. Let's lift up this last chorus. Your love never fails, it never gives, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives, it never runs out on me. Today we're going to continue our series that we started just a few weeks back entitled Whiteboard, right? And Whiteboard and this whole premise of this, of this series is that we've got some things that we have believed or heard that we like keep up here intellectually, but it struggles to actually make it down to our everyday lives. And so we talked about, you know, oftentimes companies will use a whiteboard to lay out vision and the hope is that vision will translate into the real world and that their um, uh, income would increase, that defects would decrease, all that good thing. And, and we also have been talking about football. And I know there's some team that's playing on Monday night, um, the Vols. Um, Butch Jones, I got his name this time, right? Butch Jones. Um, this will be the first time I ever cheer for an SEC team, just to know. Uh, like, I'm seriously. You know, Paul said to be all things to all people. And so I'm trying to be that this week. I'm going to be wearing a Tennessee, you know, UT shirt and cheering on the vows because I love you guys. Not because I love them, but because I love you guys. And so I guarantee what happened with Butch Jones this week is he's got a game plan. He's, he knows what Georgia Tech is going to be doing. They're going to run that stinking option, that throwback school. They're going to be running that. And he's got a scheme of how to do that. And he wrote oftentimes this week on the board, this is what we're going to do when they do this. The hope of Butch Jones is that what he wrote up here on the whiteboard actually translates to a W, right? Right? That's, that's what his hope is, that his defense would respond, his offense, special teams, they would respond. That it wouldn't just stay intellectual up here on the board, but it would be translated to real life. And so we've been looking at some different things like the kingdom of God. What in the world does that mean? What's it mean to be saved? Last week, Jamie talked about our, our identity in the kingdom, right? And so today we're going to tackle another word. Um, just to be upfront with you, this word uh, is, can be somewhat divisive when you talk about denominations and backgrounds and traditions. Uh, that's what I love about our church is we have people that were raised hardcore Baptist. We've got people that were raised hardcore Pentecostal and everything in between. Uh, we've got people that have never been to church before that show up here. And I'm so glad about that. I love that. And so here's what I'm going to ask for you today. I'm going to ask for some humility and some grace. Here's the beautiful part about this today. This is us expressing in Christ what we believe about this certain thing. 
And there is so much grace for all of us to come to this church. Even if you disagree with me, that's great. Let's go grab a cup of coffee and let's talk about it. But today, the, the word that I want to dig into that we know about up here, but what does it mean in our real life is the word baptism. And immediately, somebody's got a thought of he better not say that. Well, I might just say that today. We'll see. Um, but baptism, what in the world does it mean? Well, this word baptism is uh, rooted in a word that the Greeks use that's called baptizo. Everybody say baptizo. That felt so good. Let's just say it again. Baptizo, right? It sounds almost Italian, but it's not. It's Greek. Um, baptizo. And literally what baptizo men means is to cleanse by immersing. And so, you know, baptizo, this word, would have been used like, hey, I got a cucumber and I need to clean it. I'm going to dip it in the water, clean it, and raise it up. Guess what I did? I just baptizoed my cucumber, <laughs> right? Because it literally means to dip into water to cleanse. That's, that's what the word means. And so today, I, I want us to unpack a little bit. What is baptism? Why should you and I care? And if I've already been baptized, what does that mean today? Does, is that just a past tense thing or does it matter to me today and so we want to dig into baptism and a couple things we need to know is baptism was not specific to Christianity uh, baptism actually happened way before anybody was ever first called a Christian it's before Jesus it happened way back even in the Jewish culture way way back think of Moses and all those guys you got the law they practiced washing and their washing was very specific to if a Gentile so somebody who's not a Jew wanted to become a Jew a couple of the things they had to do is one, if you're a man, you had to have surgery, which is not fun. It's called circumcision, right? You, it's not fun. Like that was, you can laugh a little bit. It's okay. It's awkward. I know I get it. But that was one of the requirements. If you wanted to become a Jew, you had to be able to have an outward expression of that Judaism, right? But then also one of the things that a person had to do to become a Jew was you had to be baptized. You had to be washed in the water and raised up, signifying a change. Now, it wasn't just the Jewish culture actually many pagan religions required some form of baptism and then if we fast forward to the new testament the very front end when this wild and crazy man who ate honey and locusts like john the baptist comes on and he is baptizoing he's baptizing people but john isn't baptizing gentiles into judaism he's actually baptizing jews which is different, never been done before, very different. And John's message is, hey, there's something new about to happen. There's one coming. I am not him, but there's one coming. And so repent, literally change your mind, prepare for what is coming. So John's baptism was a baptism of preparation for what was going to come in a willingness to align with God. That's what John the Baptist did. Now, many people came out to hear John the Baptist, people that wanted to criticize him, people that wanted to hear what he said, people that wanted to align their life with what he said. And so many people actually would line up to be baptized by John the Baptist, to literally be immersed, dunked in the water, and to be raised back up, many people. And one day, there was a big, long line of people there. But this day was different. This day, a 30-year-old man who was born to Mary and Joseph was in that line, and his name was Jesus. And if you have your Bibles, open up to Luke chapter 3, and we're going to see that as John was baptizing many Jews, this man, Jesus, he comes up, and something very interesting and very profound happens. So verse 21 of Luke chapter 3 it says, Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized, and he was praying, the heavens were open, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, and you I am well pleased. So, so Jesus, the son of God, the one who spoke the world into existence, who was and is and always will be, that Jesus, the son of God, was baptized. What in the world? What, why would Jesus need to be baptized? And the first thing I want you to write in your notes is that Jesus was baptized to identify with us. This is a beautiful picture of Jesus, his desire to so be with us and identify with us that he was willing to be baptized, to be washed. It's a beautiful picture. 
Now, when you think about that day, you know, I was thinking this week of how do I demonstrate this one. And I was thinking about, you know, when you go to the airport and you've got like the exclusive priority lane. Anybody know what those kind of people are? Yeah. You got the priority lane that never has a line. And then you got ones like you and me. This is the Joe Schmoes use of like the general boarding. And there's always a deep, deep line, right? Just go f- with me for a second, and this is, this is really me just kind of explaining. This is not biblical. Don't, don't read me. told me this, but it's not anti-biblical necessarily. But just imagine if there were two lines when John the Baptist was baptizing people. Right, there would have been a line for those that had no sin. And let me tell you, that line never saw anybody standing there. No line whatsoever was there. Jesus could have been the first and only person to step in that line, but he chose not to. He actually chose to get in a long line of people to stand there to identify with sinners. Somebody's baptized, step up. Next person's baptized, step up. Jesus was baptized to identify with us. And finally, he gets up to John, and John baptizes him just as he did the sinner before and the sinner after him. Jesus was baptized to identify us. And really, it's, it's one of the, the fruitions and one of the fulfillments of what Isaiah said in Isaiah 53, that, that the Messiah, the coming one, that he would be numbered with his transgressors, that he himself would be identified with the sinners, you and me. And so this is a beautiful picture that we see is Jesus didn't say, hey, I'm not going to associate with you. He said, no, I'm going to go so far to associate with you that I'm going to get in the same line as you and I'm going to be baptized just as you are baptized, it's a beautiful expression of Jesus' willingness to identify with us. But that's not all it is. The second thing I want you to write down is Jesus was baptized to fulfill all righteousness. Uh, there's a, there's a, another um, perspective of this moment in Matthew chapter 3, verse 15. Uh, John has seen that Jesus is now there. And John says, hey, Jesus, I can't baptize you. Like, I'm... I'm not worthy to even unlace your, 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 your sandals. So, so I can't baptize you. And this is what Jesus' response is. He says, let it be so now. Thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. So, so Jesus says, hey, John, listen, I, I know you're, you, you don't think you're worthy of this, but, but listen, we need to do this because this is the will of God. See, that's, that's what he says here when it says fulfill all righteousness. Literally, what that word broken down to is Jesus saying, I've got to fulfill the will of God. I want to align myself with God. This is what Jesus is saying when he goes ahead and says, I need to be baptized to fulfill all righteousness. Is I'm going to do everything aligned with God. And so God wanted him, the Father wanted Jesus to be baptized. And so he says, I'm going to do it. I'm going to obey. And so Jesus being baptized it is a willingness to align himself with God. It's a beautiful picture because this marks the beginning of his ministry. And his ministry was marked with a willingness to align with God, with what he said and what he did. That's what we read about in John chapter 14. Jesus says this. He says, but I do as the Father has commanded me. Literally, Jesus says, I I do only what the Father says. What is that? That's obedience. That's fulfilling the will of God. That's what Jesus' life was. And then a little bit later, or a little before that, in John chapter 12, he says, For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Jesus' life was one submitted to the Father and filled with the Spirit of God. His life was marked with obedience to his father and willingness to align himself with it. And so baptism was the first public proclamation of Jesus' willingness to align his life, no matter the cost, to what his father wanted. It's a beautiful picture. Jesus was willing, and this is what his baptism represented. Now, now we see Jesus. He, he, he had a lot of value for baptism because he actually did it himself. He was water baptized. But it didn't stop there. At the end of Jesus' time on this earth, before he ascended to be with the Father, Jesus gathered his disciples together. And in Matthew 28, I believe it's in your notes there at the top, in Matthew 28, Jesus gives them some things to consider and the things to do. So he gathers them together and he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. 
Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the ages. So Jesus says, hey guys, I'm going to be leaving, so listen, these are some things I want you to do. This is relevant to you and me today too, right? As followers of Jesus Christ, we're his disciples. This is just as relevant to you and me as it was then. And he says, listen, if you're my followers, this is what you're gonna, you're gonna make other followers. You're gonna disciple. And not only are you gonna disciple, when they step into the kingdom, guess what you're gonna do, guys? You're gonna baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then you're gonna teach them all that I taught you. This is really the foundation of what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus. And so not only was baptism important to Jesus for himself, but baptism was important for his followers, and we see that the disciples actually baptized many people throughout the scriptures, throughout Acts, throughout the gospels, his disciples baptized other disciples. And so we have to ask the question, what does baptism mean to you and me today? That's, that's the question we wanna answer. And the first thing I want you to write in your notes is we are baptized to identify with God. We are baptized to identify with God in his life and his death and his resurrection. If you have your Bible, open up to to Romans chapter six. Uh, Romans is a a deeply theological book with so much meat to chew on. And and, in chapter six, uh, Paul writes to the Roman church and he gives them some insight and some understanding to what is this baptism? What, What is this about? Why do we need to be water baptized? What is it about? And this is what Paul says in chapter six, Starting in verse 4, he says, We were buried, therefore, with him, Jesus, by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. And so what is baptism? It's first, it's identification with God for us. Now, we are saved by faith. There's nothing to add to that. Let me just make that really clear. You're not earning special faith grace credits when you're baptized. By faith, you have been saved, not Anything that you have done so that you could boast, right? That's what we believe. So it's by faith. But that subsequent step of obedience is me identifying with God. And this is what Paul beautifully puts. This is the picture, the imagery that we have when we are baptized. He says, listen, when somebody comes up to be baptized, this is what you're going to do. You're going to take them and you're going to dip them under the water. And and when you dip them under the water, what that is signifying is that they have died. Just as Christ has died, they have died to themselves. They've died to their old way of thinking. They've died to the old way of doing it. And so they are buried under the waters of baptism. And then they don't stay there. Amen to that? You don't grab a snorkel and stay there. He says, then what do you do? You raise them up with Christ to walk in newness of life. So when we're baptized, we are associating our life with Christ, that we have now died to our old ways, that we've received the forgiveness and grace of God, and now we are walking in faith in the newness of life. This is what baptism represents. It's a beautiful picture of our association with God. Now, here's what I think sometimes we forget. And so if you've been baptized and you're sitting there thinking, what does it have to do with me? I want you to tune in just for a moment here. You know, when we are baptized after our saving faith, what we're doing is we're identifying with God first and foremost. Our primary allegiance, our primary association is now child of God. It trumps everything. I'm now a child of God before I'm a Democrat or Republican. I'm now a child of God before I'm an American. Or a southerner. I'm a child of God before my vacation, before any relationship. I am a child of God. I have identified myself with God. I have I recognize that I've been dead and I've been brought to life. That is my association. It supersedes everything and it becomes the lens that which we view everything else. This is what it looks like when we're baptized. We associate, we identify with God. And the second thing that it does is we are baptized to express our faith to express our faith. And I believe this is twofold, and I think it's twofold for this reason. I think the first way we express our faith is a public declaration of what God has done in our lives. 
That's why we gather together, and that's why we celebrate and we cheer on people when they're baptized, because it is a public declaration of an association of faith that says, man, I trusted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and now I'm taking a step of obedience to align my life with his in-water baptism. And so we celebrate that. That's a community. So the community comes a lot around you and encourages you. It also is a testimony to those that haven't believed. And that's why we'd have our little videos that we show up here when somebody's baptized because we want to give them a chance to tell their story because every one of us has a story. And we're all part of his story. And so when we show their little video before somebody's baptized, the hope of that is for them to express their, their um, the forgiveness and grace and love they've received from God. What changed everything by the grace of God. And then today, that day that they are baptized, they're expressing their faith. But it's not just a a community faith that's expressed. It's also a deeply personal expression of faith, one that I don't think we always give credit to. You know, we don't have to have a large audience to be baptized. Uh, You look at Philip, and when he baptized the eunuch, the Ethiopian eunuch, it was just him. Those two guys went down to the pond and were baptized. It was beautiful. But it's also a personal expression of faith because when I'm baptized, it serves as an anchor point in my life for me to reflect on and remember what I have been given, which is new life. Not that it gave me new life, but it's remembrance of what God had done through faith, right? And so those moments of doubt, those moments of frustration and friction, when they come about, I can look back to my water baptism and remember, wait, that's right, I was buried with Christ, but I didn't stay under the water. I was raised up to newness of life, and now I have hope. It's an expression of faith community-wise, but also a deeply personal expression of faith. Now, Now we have to ask the question, who should be baptized? Who should be baptized? Well, here's what we believe at Christ Fellowship. Anyone who has publicly, or not publicly, anyone who has confessed their faith in Christ should be baptized. That's really clear in Scripture. We see that they believed and they were baptized. And so the next question that we should ask is, is when should I be baptized? That's a great question, right? When should I be baptized? And, and what we believe as we read the Scripture is that when somebody is given salvation from God by faith in Jesus alone, that that next step of obedience is baptism. So whether it's been a day or 10 years or 20 years, and maybe you're 85 years old here today and you said, man, I followed Jesus, but I've never been baptized. Guess what? Today is a great day because you can still get baptized. Because it's a subsequent response to the faith that we've placed in Jesus. It's a beautiful expression. Now, here's what you need to know about me. I wasn't baptized until I was 25 years old. Uh, I had been a Christian for 13 years, but I'd never taken the step in obedience to be baptized. And so I was 25 years old when I was baptized. And I still remember the day my, my good friend Matthew Johnson baptized me. And, and I remember I, I did the whole thing, you know, do this. And, he bapt- and what's, what's funny is actually I had a, a phone that actually got baptized with me. So we try to tell people, you know, take your phones out. But I was baptized and I felt like he was like bringing me back up. But then he double dipped me, which was really interesting. Not really biblical, but, but he, like, he, like, he like, I don't know if he thought at the moment, I'm like, well, I guess I'm a double sinner. Like, I don't know what it is, but he like, Later, he told me when I, he did me the first time, there was this little spot that was dry on my forehead. And so he just went ahead and just like dunked me even further and brought me up. Uh, disclaimer, we will not do that to you. Like, don't worry about that. But it's a great memory for me. But when I struggle with some faith or questions, I go back to that moment to remind myself that I was buried with Christ, but I didn't stay there. I was raised to walk in newness of life. And it's a beautiful anchor for me. And then I think the third question we have to ask, after we say who should be saved or who should be baptized, those that are saved, when should be subsequent salvation? The third question, who should baptize? Who should baptize? And and traditions you were raised in, maybe it was always the pastor, maybe it was a deacon or elder, and, and we validate that, we honor that, but I just don't believe in the scripture that there is a preset requirement for somebody to baptize somebody else other than this, so hear me other than that person is already a follower of Jesus Christ. And you say, where do you, where do you find that, Derek? I find that in the words of Jesus. He says, his disciples will make disciples and they will baptize. He gave them authority, not just permission, but he said, hey, this is actually an expectation. My disciples, they walk others into the kingdom. And when they walk into the kingdom, they, they baptize them. So if you've already been baptized today and you're like, man, what does this have to do with you? Here's, here's the golden lining for you. And this is my challenge and invitation to each one of you. I want you to hear this. If you're a follower of Jesus, you've already been baptized. Here's the gift you've been given. And this is the prayer that I want you to pray for the next 12 months. 
that you would have the opportunity to step on the stage and baptize somebody that you walk into the kingdom of God. Like I said, you've not only been given permission, he set an expectation. Disciples make disciples and disciples baptize others into the kingdom of God. It's a beautiful thing. And so what would it look like for you to have that on your radar screen for something you're praying for, your friends, your family, your coworkers, and you got to see them come into the kingdom of God, be saved by faith through Jesus. And then you got to get up here one Sunday. You got to see their story that you played a part in that you got to actually take them under the water and raise them up to symbolically show that they were dead in their sin, but now they are alive in Christ. This is what it looks like to follow Jesus. And this is the privilege that we have and the honor that we have. So my question for you today is if you are a follower of Jesus Christ and you have not been baptized, what is keeping you? Some of us don't want to get baptized because we don't feel like we have our life all aligned, right? Uh, I was there. Like, I got to figure out this part over here before I, like, I want to get rid of this sin, then I can be baptized. Let me tell you, there was nobody that's ever been baptized that's been perfect. Amen to that? Only Jesus. Here, here's the requirement to be baptized. Not that you're perfect, but that you're willing to follow the perfect one. It's a big difference. And so if you're sitting there today and say, man, I've got some things going on in my life, some struggles that I'm not doing with, so I, I want to get those cleaned up before I'm baptized. Listen, once you get rid of A, guess what? There's B to get rid of. And once you get rid of B, there's C to get rid of. And so don't waste. Take a step of obedience. Take a step of faith and trust God. Just like salvation, right? He met us at our worst in the midst of our sin and saved us. Don't wait to get everything right because it never will happen. Listen, I tell many people when I meet with them and when I preach to, to pray about what I'm saying. The first time and probably one of the few times you'll hear me say this, if you're a follower of Jesus, you don't need to pray if you need to be baptized. You need to do it. Not for salvation, but for an expression of your faith and identification with Christ. And this is what I know. With obedience comes blessing. I don't know what that blessing is going to look like in your life. I don't know what it means in your spiritual walk with Christ, but I guarantee you there is a blessing when we say yes to God. So if you want to be baptized in the coming weeks, we would invite you to do that. You can go online. You can go in our app. You can stop out at the connection counter and you can just say, I want to be baptized. And we will celebrate with you and we will come around you and support you because it's a beautiful expression of our identification with Christ that we died to sin, but we were raised to walk in newness of life. Father, thank you so much for this time this morning that we can gather in your name, that we can dig into your truth, your scripture. And I pray that you would um, stir us up to walk in your spirit to obey you in the little things and in the big things. Lord, I ask that you would encourage us to make disciples and to see us baptize people in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, Lord, I pray that our church, every person in our church would have the great honor and experience to, to walk somebody into a relationship with you and then to actually baptize them. I ask that, Lord. May it be so. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Mm-hmm.